OK, so thank you ever so much for joining us this evening for our live presentation on male factor infertility. Um, we are going to be um, using the Q&A section on Teams this evening. You can access that through the banner at the top of your screen. Um, so if you just pop any questions in there, my colleagues are ready and able to reply to your emails and to your questions. Um, and if there's anything a bit more in depth, then we'll get back to you afterwards as well. So um, today's presentation, um, as I say, is on male factor infertility. So we're mainly going to be focusing on that today, um, but we will give you also a little bit of background about the clinic and also um, about the other things that Hearts and Essex can um, assist and help with as well. So uh, my name is Gemma. I'm one of the embryologists um, here at Hearts and Essex. So I spend most of my time in the lab, um, which means I'll be um, helping um, people by undertaking the semen analyses. Um, but then also after that, once you come through for treatment, if that's something you decide to do, um, I'll be helping with my colleagues um, egg collection, embryo creation and growth, and then also in helping you to choose the right embryos for transfer as well. Um, so throughout the uh, whole process, um, we'll be there, but often it's an embryologist that you'll see quite early on or at least speak to on the phone, um, particularly when we're talking about male factor. So the presentation today will cover all of that. And then afterwards, we're going to post a link into the Q&A section, um, which you can follow if you would like to have a virtual tour of the clinic. Um, we'll then stay online after the presentation as well to answer any more questions that might have come in. And then after that, we will be asking you for some feedback. It's really good for us to know what you enjoyed about the presentation today or if there's anything else that you'd have liked to have heard from. Um, and we can try to take that on board for future events. So Hearts and Essex itself um, was founded as the Essex Fertility Centre in 1989. So we've got over 34 years of experience, um, which in total comes to over, over 7,000 babies that have been born after treatment um, through the Essex and Hearts and Essex Fertility Centre as we now are. And all of our procedures are um, performed under the roof um, of the one clinic that we have here um, in Chesant. And um, we have a state of the art purpose built clinic. Um, and as I say, everything is all done here. All appointments are done here and all the staff are based here as well, um, which means that we can offer um, a really sort of uh, one site uh, package and uh, treatments for everyone. So the actual treatments that we offer and the services that we provide are quite wide ranging. Um, they start with the sort of fertility assessment side of things. Some people just wanting to get ideas of sort of where they might be and help them to plan their fertility um, and their uh, family planning in the future. Um, but then some people obviously then discover there are problems or things are taking longer than they'd like. And then we have packages such as IVF, ICSI and PICSI, um, which are forms of in vitro fertilisation. So that's where we collect sperm and eggs and we do fertilisation of them in the lab and then we get those embryos back. Um, we also do uh, perform IUI, which is where we collect the sperm and then we prepare that in the lab. But the embryo is actually created inside um, a lady who is going to be carrying that pregnancy. Um, so that's another option for a lot of people. We also have fertility preservation um, methods that we can use. So some people, perhaps if um, you're thinking of delaying um, starting a family until later, but want to preserve your fertility, if you've got any medical conditions um, or people who are going through gender um, affirming surgeries um, or treatments, um, may choose to freeze their embryos um, or eggs or sperm before going down that sort of path. We also offer a lot to do with um, gamete donation. So by gametes, I mean sperm or eggs. Um, and we have lots of different pathways, both for people looking to donate, but also those looking to use donor gametes as well. We also offer surrogacy services here, which is um, a big part of the work that we do. Um, so that in, the, in those cases would usually be um, use, using um, either the sperm or the eggs um, from, from a couple um, and with a surrogate, which we can um, facilitate that as well. We can also then a little bit further down the road, we can help with pregnancy scans um, and offer additional testing um, in early pregnancy um, for reassurance, whether you've had treatment with us or otherwise. And we can undertake a lot of gynaecology screening as well. Most of our doctors here are specialists, gynaecologists first and foremost. Um, so there's a lot there that we can offer too. And there's other treatments as well, um, but most of those are sort of pinned onto the things we've already mentioned there and can just sort of help to um, expand on what we can offer you. So today's talk, as I say, is going to be mainly on male factor infertility. So the first thing to start with there is probably a definition. So when you Google male factor infertility, um, what usually comes up is this um, piece of text, which 
essentially is quite an old um, definition now. It was written in 1985 and it's um, a little bit heteronormative um, and assumes that you have a male and a female um, in a couple and that um, even though the female has been shown to be fertile after at least one year of unprotected intercourse, that person is not pregnant. Um, and therefore it's seen um, as a male factor if they believe that the reasoning for this comes from the man. In a sort of more modern sense, really what we're talking about is people who have some sort of problem with their sperm, um, whether that's availability of the sperm or the quality of it, um, and that we think that that is the cause for the reason why someone is not able to conceive. So this pie chart just sort of summarises um, a, a lot of different data, but basically dependent on how you sort of chunk it up, more than half of people who are not able to conceive in a couple, um, there is a sperm cause. Oftentimes it can be a sperm cause all by itself. Sometimes it's that we know that there's only a problem um, from the female side of things, so either an egg or a uterus problem. But most of the time it's actually a problem of the two things together. So you may find that someone's sperm uh, parameters are slightly poorer, um, but coupled with that, they may be with a partner, a female partner um, who perhaps doesn't have a particularly high egg reserve or something like that. So it's not often that it's just sperm on its own, but it's usually a confounded factor um, alongside um, a female issue as well. And frustratingly for many couples, actually after all the testing, we find that there's no problems um, that we can immediately identify on either side, um, but we're still not um, being able to get pregnant. And in this case, we call this an unexplained infertility, and that also accounts for about 20% of um, infertile uh, people. So the causes of male factor infertility are really broad. Um, there's lots and lots of things that can um, cause um, a male to be unable to have a pregnancy in the sort of natural way, although that's obviously not a particularly um, helpful term a lot of the time, but we're talking about through unprotected intercourse. Um, and these causes can sometimes be reversible, but other times it is irreversible. Once the thing that has caused this has happened, it may be that we never re restore sperm function to the fullest um, level that it was before. So these can be things such as hormonal problems. Um, these can maybe perhaps linked to a specific disease or a syndrome. It can just be something that crops up um, at some point in your life, but it can also be something that's genetic. So it's been there all along. There's also things such as um, if we call them acquired urogenital abnormalities. So this could be after an injury or a disease or an infection. Um, but also another cause of male infertility that we do see quite often is actually through sexual dysfunction. So although the sperm and eggs, uh, sperm sorry, is being made, um, if someone is unable to get that sperm out of their body through intercourse, then obviously we're not going to get the sperm and eggs meeting. So there's lots of causes there um, that were sort of just in this summary. Um, and as I say, some of them are reversible, but others are more likely to um, persist and, and have caused the problem. So then the next issue is, so how do we identify the male factor infertility? And then what can we do about it? So the assessment and diagnosis process is all sort of designed around what we're going to do once we've done the assessment and got the diagnosis. So we want to try to identify what the contributing factors are likely to be. Then we want to try to treat any that might be reversible. So for example, if you're a heavy smoker, then that's likely to have an impact on your sperm quality and function. So we can try to help you to um, stop smoking or at least to reduce, and that may then try to pick up your um, sperm uh, function uh, from there. We can also then try to determine whether or not fertility treatment or ART, which stands for um, artificial reproductive therapies, um, may be beneficial for you. It's not always the answer for everybody, um, but it is often an option um, which can get around a lot of sperm um, and male factor um, issues. And the other important part to, fa to factor in as well is that we can offer counselling um, as well for any conditions that we might discover that are irreversible or untreatable. It's, um, it's often the case that a sperm problem may also um, indicate other um, medical health issues as well. So it's really important that we're looking at this as a holistic thing and we're not just focusing on the fact that the sperm um, isn't functioning as it should be. We need to make sure that we're supporting you um, in a wider way as well. So. The first thing that we often do for the assessment and diagnosis uh, pathway is to try to take a sexual and medical history to identify if there's any contributing factors that we can try to um, see before we even know if there's even a problem. So this list, which I don't expect you to read all of, 
Um, this list is a list that I've taken from a journal article which found that all of these different conditions and diseases can all impact um, male fertility. And so as you can see, it's a massive list. And so if you have any of these things going on in your life, then we may see that there's an issue um, with your ability to conceive. And so oftentimes male factor infertility is a small part of a wider problem. So it's important that if you do have it, whilst if you have one of these conditions, it's definitely worthwhile letting us know. In fact, if you have any condition that you think might be affecting your fertility um, and your general health, it's always worthwhile mentioning it if you are going down a fertility treatment route, because it can be something that needs to be taken into account. But on the reverse of that, if you find that you have got poor sperm parameters, if you have a test and they come back abnormal, it's always worthwhile mentioning that to your GP or your doctor um, because it might be a sign that there's something else going on. It could be a symptom of something else. So it's worthwhile thinking that these things often go hand in hand. So the main way that we diagnose infertility after the um, inability to conceive naturally um, after a year of unprotected intercourse is through a semen analysis. And what that means is that you would be asked to produce a sample of semen, which is usually produced through masturbation. And then that comes into the clinic and we analyse it um, to different sorts of criteria dependent on the purpose of the analysis. So the first type of analysis that we usually perform is a diagnostic analysis, which you can see in the uh, column um, on, the on the slide there. And what we're doing is we're just comparing all the different parameters that we can look at to what the World Health Organization has said is normal. And the way that they worked out what was normal was by looking at thousands of men who'd had natural conceptions. They analyzed all of their sperm and then they drew a sort of line in the sand and said anything below this is abnormal and anything above it is normal. But it's really worth to sort of bear in mind here that even in that study, 5% of the men who were considered to be abnormal had still had natural conceptions. So these tests are not really there to tell us whether or not you're fertile. They're just to tell us whether or not your sperm is like that of fertile men. So it's about comparing the two. So for that, um, the criteria that we use at Hearts and Essex and that the majority of clinics use, although there are some differences, so that's worth bearing in mind if you do have an analysis from somewhere else. Um, the majority of them, though, is um, to the fifth or sixth edition um, of the World Health Organization's guidelines. And the numbers are shown here. So a volume of anything more than 1.5 millilitres is considered normal. Um, a count of so 39 million sperm in total within that sample is what we're looking at. And then a concentration of 15 million per milliliter. And the rest of the um, parameters there include the motility. So that's whether or not the sperm are moving the morphology, whether or not the sperm look normal. And then there are two additional tests that we also run here at Hearts and Essex. So with the first um, five parts of this um, analysis, as I say, it's about comparing you to people that are known to be fertile. If any of these come back a little bit lower um, than these limits, it's not to say that that means that you will not be able to conceive naturally. If you told me that you had a slightly reduced morphology, for example, or a motility or concentration, and you told me that you didn't want to conceive, then I would advise you to use contraception because it's still absolutely possible. However, it's likely that if you did want to conceive, it would take a little bit longer. On average, people who have abnormal sperm parameters take longer to conceive than those who have normal parameters. So as part of this, we also, as I say, run two additional tests. These are the MAR and the HBA tests. The MAR test is looking to see whether or not the sperm have antibodies against themselves, which can cause them to get stuck together and then they get in their own way and then they can't reach the egg properly. And the HBA test is a similar test in that what we do is we ask the sperm to see whether or not they're able to bind to a specific protein, which is found in eggs. Only mature sperm can bind and only those sperm will be able to fertilise an egg. So we're just looking to see whether or not your semen contains mature sperm that could potentially fertilise an egg. They're not part of the World Health Organization standard testing and they're not done everywhere. So you may not have had those before, even if you've had an analysis elsewhere. What they're really useful for, though, is in the, the uh, extra sort of testing that we do here, which is to determine which treatment option we want to recommend for you. So even if you've had a semen analysis to a diagnostic criteria, whether with us or elsewhere, if you are considering having treatment specifically at Hearts and Essex, then we would usually want to see another sample from you so that we can analyse it to a slightly different level, um, which is the treatment option determination column that you can see on the slide at the moment. 
For those we have a slightly stricter criteria, we want to see a higher concentration and a higher motility and a higher uh, morphology score in that sample. If it manages to reach all of those benchmarks, then we usually recommend that that sample could be used potentially for an IVF cycle where we add the sperm and eggs together in a Petri dish and we let the sperm swim their own way to the egg to fertilise them. However, if your analysis comes back below those, those um, limits, then in those cases, we would usually recommend that it would do better if we inject the sperms into the eggs um, by a process called ICSI. And in this case, we're trying to maximise your chances of fertilisation. It's not a guarantee, obviously. Um, not every egg is able to fertilise, regardless of how we get that sperm into it. And not every sperm is able to fertilise an egg. But on balance, in spite of that, and in spite of the small risks that are associated with both of the two different treatment options, usually determining which one to go for is normally based primarily on the semen analysis. That said, obviously, if you've previously had ICSI elsewhere, even if you now have normal sperm, we would usually recommend that we continue with ICSI because we know that um, your sperm and eggs have been met together that way before. So all of these things are things that we would take into account once we've analysed your semen sample. The MAR and HBA tests would also be used to help us to determine whether or not we want to recommend ICSI. And the HBA specifically, we use to determine whether or not we want to recommend a process called PICSI, um, which is essentially the same as ICSI. Um, the only difference is we're trying to use a different dish to try to select specifically the sperm that are able to bind, so the more mature sperm. And we use that in cases where we have a high um, level of immature sperm in the sample. There are, of course, other tests in addition to the semen analysis. Um, and these can include having a, a physical examination um, where the doctor would examine the genitals to determine whether or not there's any sort of diseases or any um, cause for concern. It's quite common um, for people to not necessarily know what their um, medical history might be, particularly regarding their sexual health. Um, some children are born, um, for example, um, with undescended testicles. They may have had treatment or surgery to correct that, but they may not be aware of it because they'd have been very young at the time. And the physical examination can often um, help us to sort of identify any of those sorts of potential causes. There are additional tests as well that can be done, such as sperm vitality testing. So if we're not seeing a lot of motility in that sample, uh, DNA fragmentation is often used because we know that if the DNA is fragmented, then it's less likely to give us a healthy uh, embryo and ultimately a healthy baby. Um, we can also test um, your genetics and your hormones to see if there's any imbalances or any problems there that are likely to be causing um, any sort of reduction that we're seeing in your sperm quality or function. And we, it is possible as well to take a biopsy directly from the testicle to see whether or not it's actually producing sperm, um, because that's another issue there that can sort of cause um, us to not have sufficient uh, sperm in the sample to be able to have a natural conception. All of these options are things that can be discussed if and when it's necessary. It's often not, and we don't offer all of these services at Hearts and Essex directly. Um, because oftentimes it's not required, um, but there's certainly things that we can look at if we need to, as we sort of go down that path um, of trying to determine um, any causes of male factor infertility and certainly how we're going to try to get around them. So after all of that, most people are given um, a long name diagnosis, which I've included on the left here. They're all um, scientific terms um, that get used a lot for essentially quite simple um, Term, like simple um, differences um, that we might see in your sperm. So normospermia is when all of the parameters that we looked at when we did the semen analysis were completely normal, all above the limits. Aspermia would imply that there's actually no sperm coming out at all, so no semen, sorry, coming out at all, so there's no sperm because there's no um, ejaculate. Um, azoospermia is when there is an ejaculate but there's no sperm within it, which we do see from time to time. And then the other options um, are all to do with whether or not there um, are sperm in the sample, whether or not they are um, of a good concentration, a good motility and a good morphology, um, whether or not we're seeing white blood cells in the sperm as well. So leukospermia um, is where we're seeing non-sperm cells within the, uh, within the semen sample, which we wouldn't usually expect to see. It can be a sign sometimes of an infection, um, which oftentimes um, can be easily treated, but it's always worth looking into. 
Um, but it can also be a sign that um, sperm um, production isn't happening properly because before a sperm looks like a sperm, it actually looks like a round cell and then it develops and grows the tail. So we often see um, non-sperm cells in the sample um, if we have things like that. So these are all things that just highlight to the um, doctor that we might want to do some more investigations or that we might need to start thinking about ways of trying to get round the problem um, to try to help you ultimately to, to have a healthy baby. So in order to do that, we need to try to work out if we're going to treat the issues that we're seeing or if it's more prudent to try to circum circumvent the problem. So sometimes the quickest route to a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby is to treat the underlying condition first. So, for example, if you are overweight, that's likely to cause um, a reduction in sperm parameters, but also a reduction in sperm function. If we can help you to manage the weight and to lose some, um, lose some of that weight, then oftentimes that will um, cause an increase in the sperm parameters and ultimately in its function. And you may not need any fertility treatment at all. So things like that we can try to uh, we can try to do. However, um, it can be that um, that that will take a long time to get to that point. And because unfortunately we know that as we as uh, people get older, particularly as people providing the eggs get older, um, it, we can feel there's more of a time pressure um, to try to get treatment underway. So it can be that it makes more sense um, to consider ART um, as a first line approach to try to get around um, whatever the issue is. We often see people that want to continue to try to conceive naturally, which is absolutely um, a sensible course of action if you have uh, moderately reduced uh, semen parameters. Um, we know that for many people, these things fluctuate um, and actually it's often time is what's required. So that's another option. Most people, if they find that they've got um, reduced parameters, will want to try to make some lifestyle changes. And it's really hard to know exactly what lifestyle changes are required. But the general advice is that if you can live as healthy a life as you can, so make sure you're getting enough sleep, keeping stress low, drinking enough water, not drinking alcohol excessively, reducing smoking, ideally stopping entirely, um, sort of having a healthy, active lifestyle and eating well, all of those rather boring but rather sensible things will only ever make your body able to produce the best sperm it can. It might be that your body can't make great sperm, but if you're healthy, then your body will make the best that it can. And so making those lifestyle changes can be um, a nice and easy way to, to make some progress, but also to feel that you've got some control on the situation as well. It's important that we bear in mind that infertility has a huge toll um, on our mental health as well, and that there has been shown to be many links between poor mental health and um, less um, likelihood of conceiving. Um, we know that when we're very stressed, um, our hormone levels often change. Uh, that's true of men and women. And so that can impact um, sperm quality and function as well. So um, counselling is available to um, anyone who goes through fertility treatment. Um, and so if you're at that point in your journey, then it's worthwhile um, looking into that for sure. Even if you're not quite at that stage, um, there are a lot of um, counselling services available for people who are struggling with their fertility or have concerns about it as well. Um, Beaker is the um, British Institute for Counselling Association. Beaker. <laughs> um, they um, they have a lot of um, resources on the website, so um, it's definitely worth getting in touch with them as well. Um, so then the other option as well is for people who have fertility, uh, male fertility, is to consider fertility preservation. Oftentimes, if we see a reduction in sperm parameters um, or indeed function, um, then it may be that this is the beginning of um, a decline that will continue. And so it can be worthwhile to choose to preserve your sperm whilst you still have um, enough to be able to use for treatment. So you can um, arrange to have your sperm frozen. This requires you to have um, some blood testing and to complete some consent forms and to have a consultation with the doctor. Um, but it is absolutely something that is doable. And once your sperm is frozen, um, it can stay in storage for up to 55 years at the moment. Um, so it can it can be a, a good option for people if you're concerned that your sperm problem is going to um, get worse or to persist. So. That's a real whistle stop tour um, through male factor infertility. Um, there is some additional reading um, which you can um, search here. These um, links are for um, our website 
also the HFEA website, that's the um, organisation um, which regulates all fertility treatment and activity within the UK. So they're completely impartial, they're not trying to sell you anything and everything on their website is completely validated. So that can be a really valuable resource. And the top line there um, is a male infertility book, um, which is where I got a lot of the statistics from today. Um, it's just got a lot more information in there if you wanted to get sort of a bit more into the nitty gritty of the science behind it all. So. Um, now that we've sort of run through all of that with you, um, we will be sending you a feedback uh, SMS, um, just asking you to go onto SurveyMonkey to let us know um, if I've gone through everything you wanted to hear tonight, if there was anything that you wanted um, to know differently, or if there's any other topics you'd like us to cover in these events, um, please let us know because we'd be more than happy to try to get that um, sorted out for you. We're also on social media, so uh, please do connect with us. Um, we have um, a lot of blogs and information that we post um, on there. It's also a good way of sort of getting in touch with us if you've got um, more that you wanted to uh, know. And then the other option, of course, is to book an appointment, which can be done over the telephone or um, through our inquiries uh, email, which is monitored. The lines will be open tomorrow from 8 a.m. And at the moment, if you just wanted to have a semen analysis that would be available within two weeks, um, that can either be booked in um, as a um, diagnostic analysis where we'll compare your analysis sample to um, that that the World Health Organization says is sort of the normal uh, for a fertile person. So we can go down that route. If you'd like to um, have an analysis and also for um, a partner to also consider um, having some tests or something like that as well, that's also absolutely doable. And if you're at the point where you feel that now is the time to start considering fertility treatment or preservation, um, then we can book you in for the other kinds of analysis where we'll be um, trying to determine which treatment options would be best for yourselves. Um, and again, that has around about a two to three week wait at the moment as well. Christmas dependent, of course. Um, so please do get in touch um, if you have anything you wanted to go through there. You obviously can also um, have a look around our clinic. So we'll send this link out on the Q&A. Um, and then you can have sort of a virtual tour of the Hearts and Essex Centre. As I say, we're all under one roof, um, so you can have a look around and get a feel for the place um, before um, you know making any decisions about whether or not you'd like to uh, come in in person. Um, and then the Q&A is also um, open now. My colleagues are available. So we have um, Charlotte, who's one of our embryologists, and Jackie, who's one of our nurses. They're both here this evening. So if you have any questions for them, um, particularly about male factor, um, then please do pop them into the Q&A and they'll answer them for you um, as we go. So thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. Um, I hope that this has been useful um, for you and informative. And if you do come through for an analysis um, in the near future, then I look forward to uh, going through your analysis results with you. And if you've got any questions at that point, obviously we can cover them um, in more depth and uh, in a more sort of personal way um, at that point. All right, so I'm going to leave the chat now. Um, but as I say, the Q&A will still be running. So please feel free to uh, send over any questions on there. Um, and thank you again. All right, all the best.